Hi, welcome to Stories of Art. My name is Karel Huidkoper. Today's story is about Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe, one of those extremely famous paintings that everybody knows. But what do you really know about it? I'm going to talk about all kinds of different aspects of it and of its painter, uh, Edouard Manet, because they're both, well, it is one of the most famous paintings of the 19th century. He is one of the most famous painters from the 19th century. Um, but during his lifetime, he was spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, now, I'm going to tell you all about this. Before I start, though, this would be a good time to hit the subscribe button that's below this video. And then you'll, you can even hit this little bell that appears. If you do that, you get notified every time I post a new video. Anyway, let's get to the, the video, it's, uh, to the, uh, the painting itself. Um, as I said, Manet, Edouard Manet, was a spectacularly unsuccessful painter. Um, he hardly sold anything during his lifetime. And this painting, he, uh, he kept in his possession for about a decade before he could get rid of it, for a minimum price at first. That's because many people disliked it. Um, and it is strange to see that now it's so famous. A little bit about Manet. He was born in um, 1832. Came from a wealthy family, upper class of Paris, and was supposed to become a banker or something like that. And he clearly didn't want to. So his father tried to enroll him into the, in, the, in the Navy, but he failed the exam twice and then Finally, he relented, the father relented and said Manet could follow um, a career in painting, which he had been trying before. He, he, drew, he was drawing and painting all the time as, a, as an amateur. But as, a, as you would expect from a Manet is that he, um, he didn't just take any old teacher, he went to the, the most fashionable teacher of Paris at the time. He became a student of Thomas Couture, and Thomas Couture had just won a whole series of prizes at the Salon. He, basically, he won the Oscars for painting at the time. Now, he won all these prizes with this huge painting, which is about the um, uh, it, it's about Romans and their decadence, and it won all kinds of prizes for a number of reasons. One is because it was so highly finished. And it made such beautiful references to older art. Uh, you can see all these statues in it, but it's not just the ancient statues that he, he copied. He copied them also in the many different arms and legs and body parts that you see around in all these different people in different attitudes. And that was really admired at the time. Now, Manet went to study there and would receive a very much an, a, a classical education. Now, I mentioned before that Couture won all these prizes at the Salon, and the Salon is an important part of this, this story, um, and it's an, a, a word often used, but very few people actually explain what it really is. And it's very difficult to overstate the importance of the Salon for the art world in the, in the 19th century. You have to imagine that about 200 years earlier, in the 17th century, there was a king in France, Louis XIV, and he thought that the art production of his country was not as good as it was in his neighboring countries of Italy or the Netherlands or Spain. And he wanted to give a, a boost to that production uh, or to the quality. And to, to do so, he, well, not really he, his, his go-to man was a, a man called Colbert, and Colbert, he started this, this arts academy. And the idea was that if you uh, were a member, you wouldn't actually learn how to paint. You would have to be an accomplished master to even become a member, but they could exchange views and exchange experiences and, and, that, and so well, boost their own quality. Painters need an incentive to become a member. If you were a member, you could participate in the Salon. And the Salon, something they invented at the same time, was a small exhibition held in one of the living rooms of the palace in Paris. The Royal Palace, the Louvre, wasn't a museum yet. It was simply a palace for the king. 
and he would open up one of his living rooms, which in France is a salon, and they would ex exhibit a number of works there, and he would give prizes. The king would give prizes. So that would really boost your popularity. Um, you could say that you had a sort of a royal seal on everything you did after that. Now, at first, this was a very small thing. A few dozen painters, a few dozen paintings, and they held them every five years, I think. But over time, it grew. They became bigger, more painters were allowed in, more paintings were shown, and the Louvre was more and more used for these, these salons. Of course, France changed the political system a number of times, and I think at some point, the, the biggest salon ever had 8,000 paintings there, which is a ridiculous amount, amount, much more than anyone could could really study and see in the, in the two years that the salon would last. But they were the key to getting noticed as a painter. And to be noticed, there were a few things you had to do. One is you had to have a painting of a, of a considerable size. You couldn't come up with just a tiny little picture because that would be lost between all the other paintings. So you wanted some sort of size. Uh, another one, another thing you had to do is you had to have just the right amount of controversy because you don't want a painting nobody talks about. And controversy would not just be something that visitors of the salons would, would have in between them. There wouldn't just be academic talks or whatever. No, before you entered the salon, you had to be judged by a, a, a jury. They would say if a painting was good enough to actually be entered. And they would actually publish a list of the paintings that they allowed in. But they would also publish a list of refusals. Actually, they didn't do that at first. They started doing that when the public demanded it. And the thing is that it was such a big deal in, in society, in, in Paris, in France, and actually in Europe, that newspapers got involved. Journalists started to sing the praises of certain painters that they said had to come in into the salon. And, and if they were refused, they would write stories about how ridiculous this jury was. And that could go on for months uh, in, in newspapers because the jury would answer in articles in newspapers as well. And it was, it was a big deal. Now, by the time that this painting was made, it was 1863. Manet was at the time, I think 31 years old. He had painted it the year before and he entered it to the jury so they could judge whether or not it would be allowed in. So basically the first hurdle. And they refused. They said, no, it wasn't good enough. Actually, Manet had, a couple of years before, entered two paintings that had been good enough, that had been allowed in, but they um, were unremarkable in the sense that the public didn't really notice them. So there was no scandal. In this case, it's a, a little bit more scandalous, obviously because of this, this new lady in, in front. So it would be noticed more. It did, even though it was not allowed in. And in this particular year, 1863, the jury had obviously decided to have a smaller salon. Not 8,000 paintings, but a much smaller number. 5,000 paintings were entered to the jury, and they refused more than half of them actually 2,700 and, and a bit. So well over half of the paintings were refused. That led to a public outcry and mostly in newspapers. And that actually reached the emperor. At the time, France had an emperor called Napoleon III. And Napoleon III actually got involved. Actually, Napoleon III is the, uh, would be the nephew of the big Napoleon, son of his brother. And Napoleon III got involved and he said, well, we have to do something. So that would be the official salon. And then he opened in a building nearby where they would have a salon des réfugiés. So a, another salon, but for the paintings that had been refused. Painters would actually have the option to join that one or, or just forgo the whole thing. So if you were refused, you could 
choose to go to the Salon de Refusé. And, and Manet did. Manet entered his painting in the Salon de Refusé and, well, about 500 others did as well. In the Salon de Refusé, people went there basically to laugh at the bad paintings and, and horrible art. A bit like these talent shows you have these days where they show horrible additions just to ridicule people. Well, it's pretty much what people expected of the Salon de Refusé, but a number of paintings stood out and were admired. And obviously this is one of those. Now, why was this painting rejected in the first place? Often people assume that's because of this naked lady in the front, but that's not the case. Nudity was completely normal in art as it is today. They weren't prudish about it. Now, it was rejected first and foremost because of its style and it looked as if it was unfinished to the jury. So they said that the, the use of paint was simply not good enough. Today, by the way, it's called Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which is often translated as the luncheon in the grass. What it really is, is a picnic. I, I don't know why you would call it the luncheon in the grass when it's so clearly a, just a picnic. Anyway, the nudity was not the problem. The problem is it is a, an unfinished sort of style. You can see the brush strokes and the fashion was that you would not see the brush strokes. This is a, a work that was entered at the same in the same year and won several of the prizes. And here you can not see any brush strokes at all. It looks extremely finished. It looks almost as a photograph. But Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, here you can. You can see there's a rough working in, in these plants and it sort of looks, well, well, unfinished. Manet tried to show that he had looked at other, other art, that he had referenced classical art because he knew the jury would like that. And there are some obvious examples of that. Um, here's a, a print that he definitely knew. It's, it's a print made after a painting by, uh, by Raphael. And Raphael is one of those well, high Renaissance artists that everybody sort of regarded as a almost a god of painting. Now one of these was owned by the Academy and he had definitely seen it there. Or at Thomas Couture who had a copy as well. So he knew, definitely knew this one. And it's pretty obvious that this group in the, at the side, there's a, a bunch of river gods there. Basically, he copied that, that composition for his Déjeuner sur l'herbe. So it's a very ob obvious reference to older classic art. And the jury would know that. Now, also the fact that there's this, this nude, actually two almost nude ladies with dressed people around it was also a reference to other art because Titian and Giorgione and many others had done this before. At the time, there were about 50 paintings with this combination of dressed men and nude women in the Louvre itself. So that was really not um, a strange thing to see, but, but in these older paintings, they were often seen as examples of mythology or some, some grand story and their nudity is completely allowed. Here, for some reason, the woman in front is not a nude, she is just sort of naked. There's a difference. Uh, there's an artistic difference. And the difference is not just her body, but the difference is in her attitude. The difference is that she stares at us and that makes her unashamed. And that is sort of different from most paintings that you would find of nudes. But by the time that this painting was hung at the, at the Refusé, the, the Salon de Refusé, it was visited by lots of people and it caused a different scandal. Because different from what the jury had said, they just thought of it as unfinished and not good enough, the scandal of the, the actual picture started at the Refusé. There people started to say, there's these two men and, there's, and these two women must be prostitutes. What was often assumed is that this was a scene taking place in a, in a place called the Bois de Boulogne. Uh, it's a forested area, sort of upstream on the, on the Seine, upstream of Paris. 
And it was an area where lots of people went to enjoy themselves on the weekends, rent boats there, you could have tea and, and drinks and whatever there. But it was also a place that at night was notorious for its prostitution. Apparently it still is today. But that was the situation at the time. And, and people would say, these are two prostitutes and their clients. Which is kind of strange, really, if you look at it. Because this lady is sitting here and the other one's bathing in, in, in the background. And these two gentlemen are not looking at them. In fact, it's almost, they're almost trying to look away. And well, I admit I have very little experience in these things, but I don't think that if you go to a prostitute, you bring snacks, do you? Because they did. There's, there's food there. Just in front, there's this, this fruit and there's this bread. It's a picnic. And that's the other interpretation, which is actually a more likely one, is the one that was published by Emile Zola. Emile Zola was a writer, journalist, friend of Manet. So he actually talked to Manet about this painting and his interpretation, therefore, probably more correct than, than the assumptions of the public. Because he wrote an article that they're not prostitutes at all. They're actually people who the, the women are having a bath, or one is still having one and the other is drying off in the sun. And it actually makes sense because the painting at first was called the bath, le bain, not le déjeuner sur l'herbe. It's a name that it, it's basically le déjeuner sur l'herbe is a nickname it got over time. But the original title that Manet gave it was le bain. And what Zola said, it's that it's set not in the blood of Bologna, but near a family house in the woods, further upstream of the, on the Seine, near a house that the Manet family owned. Kind of makes sense, I suppose. And the women are not prostitutes. They've just had a bath and are drying. And it, if you look at the painting itself, if you go through the details of it, it kind of makes sense. It, you, you see that, she's, that the lady in front is actually sitting near this well, picnic, there's, there's food there, and there's also her clothing. She's sitting sort of on top and next to her clothing, and she's actually pretty clearly drying off. And, and these two gentlemen that are not looking at her are probably doing so out of politeness, not staring at the naked lady in, in between them. What's actually weird is they're not looking at each other either. It's surprising how little contact there is between the four people in this painting. And it's actually one of the things people thought was kind of weird about it. You have this one man on the right who's clearly mansplaining something, and a guy on the left who's not really listening. Oh, maybe he's listening, but he's sort of looking off into space. And of course, there's this woman in the background nobody's paying attention to at all. And one in the foreground who's pretty much being ignored as well. There's also this, this thing that it was claimed, and it has often been claimed, that it was not painted outside. By the time that this was painted, many painters had started working outside. That had become possible only 40 years before, when, when for the first time paint was produced in, in little tubes. Uh, before that, you had to make your own. And when paint was produced in tubes, you could suddenly take it with you, you could set up shop outside and paint whatever you would see. And it had become very fashionable. But Manet didn't go along with this fashion. He always painted inside. It was actually much later in his career when he had met Monet, when he first started to try working outside, but he didn't really like it. So he usually worked inside. And he probably set up uh, his different characters, the people in, in this painting, he probably drew them at different times. He wouldn't get all four of these people in his studio and then just tell them to hold still. Now he would, uh, he would have one of the guys at one point, one of the women at another point, and just draw them and then add the drawings, compose from his drawings and sketches the entire picture. And there's a, a sort of a, a, a strange reference to that because this one man on the right he's wearing this tasseled hat which is a hat that people would wear indoors not outside and it's kind of weird 
to have that on during a picnic. Now, of course, it's not a photograph. Manet could have easily just painted him without it. It's therefore sort of a, a, a strange, weird sort of thing inside the painting, and a reference that, that people at his, in his time would definitely have recognized, that basic, basically someone is walking outside in his bathrobe, something like that. Now, the fun thing is that we actually know of everyone in the picture who they are. They're, they're all, well, more or less portraits. First, the, the naked lady in the front is Victorine Meurin. She was one of Manet's favorite models. She modeled for him a whole bunch of times. And one of his other very, very famous paintings is of her as well. It's the Olympia, which he was probably making while this one is, was at the Salon de Refusé. She also modeled for a bunch of different paintings, this one at a, much later in, in their careers, um, where she's at a, at a train station. You can see her holding a, a dog and a book, and there's a child that's clearly fed up with waiting, and you can sort of see that there's a, a train coming by in the, in the distance. It's all the same lady, but she's, a, she's one of his favorite models. The man on the left is actually a combination of two portraits. Uh, they're, a combination of the two younger brothers of Manet. And then there's these other two, the man with the tasseled hat and the lady in the background. And there's the lady in the background, we're not entirely sure who she is because you can't really recognize her. But she looks a little bit like Manet's wife. And that becomes more likely because the man in the front is her brother. He is actually called Lehnhoff. And there's this, there's a story, it's a bit of gossip and a story I haven't actually been able to confirm, but it's one I heard once and it's kind of a nice story. So I'm going to share it with you anyway. It involves the, the composer and pianist Franz Liszt. Apparently Liszt once traveled to the Netherlands and there he probably was on, on some sort of tour um, and he had a, a boat trip one day and they passed the city of Dordrecht now a small city, but um, what he heard was the carillon of the church nearby being played by hand. And carillon, these large instruments made out of big bells and hammers hitting them, they can be played mechanically and they can be played manually. At that time it was played manually and he was so intrigued by the sound that he wanted to meet the carillon player. Well, someone set it up and at some later point he visited this man who was called Lehnhoff, and he happened to have two children, and he at least met them as well. Uh, one was this man, Lehnhoff, who, who was a sculptor, a wannabe sculptor anyway, who wanted to go to Paris to try his uh, his luck there in the, in the, in what was then sort of the capital of art of, of the world. And there was the, the daughter, Suzanne Lehnhoff, who was an aspiring pianist who also wanted to go to Paris to try her hand at becoming a professional pianist. And Liszt liked them, they hit it off, and he promised that if they came to Paris, he would introduce them into artistic society, which he did. They came as a, as a pair, brother as sort of a chaperone to the sister, I guess. They, were, they lived at the same place for a long time. And uh, Franz Liszt introduced them to a number of people amongst whom the family of Manet. She never really made it as a, a pianist, not as a solo artist or anything. She became a piano teacher to the rich and, and famous. And one of the rich families she became uh, a teacher to was the family of Manet. And she taught Edouard Manet, his brothers, and his father. And did so for a long time. And actually, she had an affair with Edouard Manet's father but also with Edouard Manet himself. So both father and son had, a, had an affair with her for a long time, a, a, at least a decade. And at some point she became pregnant and no one knows who the father of her child was. Either father or son Manet, and maybe someone else, I don't know. Uh, he was christened Leon Lehnhoff. He got her, his, his mother's name because neither one of the Manets 
um, said it was his. Much later, when the father of Edouard Manet died, within a year, Edouard Manet married Suzanne Lehnhoff. Now, seeing her brother here in the front of the painting and a lady that slightly resembles her in the background, it is fun to think that this is Suzanne Lehnhoff. Now, as I said before, it took Manet years to get rid of this painting. He, he, after the Salon de Refusé, he took it home. It was in his studio for, for years after that. And eventually he sold it for hardly any money at all. And it, eventually it made its way into the Musée d'Orsay, where you can still see it today. And, and one of the things that people always say when they first see it is that it's so very large. It's a, it's a big picture. And that, of course, is because it was intended to be displayed at a salon, where you had to be big or go unnoticed. And nowadays you can well, still see it in the Musée d'Orsay, which is specialized, of course, in these 19th century masters. And the fun thing is you can see this picture by Couture there as well, and many, many, many others. If you ever go there, don't take just one day to see it. You need at least two. In any case, this is the story that I was going to tell you. Now, if you haven't already, you can still click that subscribe button and um, I'll see you in another video.